Source of Synergy Foundation, I'd like to thank you so much for inviting our Evolutionary Leaders Contact and Conscious Evolution Synergy Circle to offer this special Voice America program. We are so grateful to all the producers and conveners of this program, our amazing special guests, and everyone tuning in. We are here today because humanity is at a huge defining moment in our history. The worldview of Earthlings is being stretched and expanded rapidly as we enter an intergalactic age. It is truly our moment of choice to more deeply embody our inherent connection with not only all life on this planet, but also with extraterrestrial life and others in various realms of existence. Recently, there has been an increasing openness from governments, scientists, and leaders around the world on the topic of UAPs and the existence of extraterrestrial life. The implications of more overt contact with other intelligences that are part of our vast cosmos can have a huge impact on terrestrial relationships. We could also see rapid advances in science, technology, energy, and transportation. Contact will also most likely impact our own belief about our origins and our innate capacities. It can assist us in realizing more fully that we are multidimensional beings of cosmic origin and the consciousness is interconnected and interrelated, and we can link non-locally through our innate multidimensional capacities. I'm Alan Steinfeld, and I'm very happy to do this program today on a topic that is very near and dear to my level of awakening. And I am the author of this new book, Making Contact, Preparing for the New Realities of Extraterrestrial Existence. It is a collection of writings by the best and brightest in the field. And this is about the UFO phenomena and why, why it is such an important topic at this time. I have some of the contributors here to that book today. Doctors Desiree Hertog and Dr. J.J. Hertog. J.J., you want to tell us a little background about your history with the phenomenon? It actually goes back to the 70s. I was uh, one of the presenters at the First World Congress on UFOs or extraterrestrial phenomena in Acapulco, Mexico in April of 1977. I also was one of the speakers with Dr. John Mack at the First Disclosure Conference at the U.S. government authorities in Washington, D.C. in May of 1995. Many of you have seen some of the reports that I've given over the years, the news reports on extraterrestrial subjects. So we're looking at a real phenomena, but more importantly, we're here today to look at what's behind the phenomena. Definitely. And this is Dr. Desiree Hurtak, who's also an expert in the field. Well, Alan, you know that basically this phenomenon has been going on for probably even thousands of years. And you can find some unusual objects sometimes in some of the ancient drawings, both in the Far East and the Middle East, and even amongst the people of the North American continent. I just want to say we're doing this program now because everything is speeding up. There's more sightings, more people aware of this, and the government's coming forward right now to tell the world what's happening. So we're going to start with a history of some of the most famous sightings that are still with us, that have made a huge impact on our society. Exactly. And of course, you could go back even to Roswell, 1947, and now we just had the 75th anniversary of Roswell, where literally, supposedly, bodies were seen. But I think you mentioned the 1990s, because that's when it really started becoming more known to everybody. It's much nicer to go to the Ariel School, which was in Rua, Zimbabwe. And there were about 100 kids out on the playing field, and the teachers were all inside. They were actually watching and talking about what they're going to be doing for school for the next month. So they weren't paying any attention to these kids. And all of a sudden, several light objects look like UFOs that came close by. And out of these objects came beings dressed in black. I saw 
little object hovering. It was quite big, actually, and then there was little ones all around it. We saw something silver, and then we saw a man standing next to it. The eyes were, were like more pointed as they came in toward the center of the yes. head, is that? No, more circular, and this was all black. I had the opportunity to know Mr. Mackey, who was school superintendent of the Ariel School, as well as Cynthia Hine, who was working with uh, the MUFON organization in South Africa, who validated really the conversations. They were quite unusual for that time, but the age group showed that there was a clear consensus. This is something that could not have been manufactured. They came running up here in such a panic. We were in a staff meeting and we just heard them screaming, screaming, ah, and they were here, you know, and the child can't make that up. Basically what was happening is some kids, of course, they didn't see as much as others. Some were mesmerized. Literally, they were, their eyes met with these alien beings. And one of the people you and I actually talked to, who is in a film uh, from James Fox, also said that she had a break, the kind of stare that she had with this being because she was worried about her little brother. So she was consciously aware, but it wasn't an easy thing for her to break that contact and move on into helping her little brother at the time. I was working with John Mack in South Africa, and he being a psychologist with Harvard University had very pointed questions. But you know, it's so unusual that he almost lost his job because he right. talked about this telepathic communication. And what did they say? Well, basically what they were saying is that technology was being misused on this planet mm -hmm. and that we needed to be more consciously aware. Why do you think they might want us to be scared? Because maybe because we, never, we don't look after the planet and um, the area properly. That was an important, very, very important case that really broke ground. But there's been other cases and schoolyards. Another famous one is the one in Australia. If you go back to 1966 in Westall High School near Melbourne, Australia, there was over 50 kids that saw these vehicles that came down. Some of them ran off the schoolyard to see where they were going, where they were landing. Now, an ordinary suburban school, but in 1966, Westall High students and teachers insist they saw UFOs triggering a massive government cover-up. 200 students saw three of them. It was a grey, almost cylindrical um, or cigar-shaped object. All these years later, the students draw what they witnessed. But I could feel a heat and hear this buzzing sound and I could see purple lights all around it. Within 40 minutes, this area was swarming with military officials who warned witnesses never to tell anyone what they'd seen. They told me that I was wrong, that I hadn't seen anything. And if he spoke up, Clearly you were drunk on duty and that will have to be reported. And that is what I find most interesting of all, uh, that, that I was definitely being told to be quiet. JJ, why is there such a suppression on these obvious contact cases? Well, this is something that really is in the realm of needing a sociology so that people can accept the fact that there are other cosmic civilizations capable of coming down into a public arena such as a schoolyard and orientating to kids at general of different ages and different backgrounds as to the fact that we're not alone in the universe. This was a topic that was forbidden really to be discussed going back to the situation in the 1940s and 50s when the government authorities in the United States agreed that this was over the top and people were not psychologically prepared. And James Fox has just made a new movie about another case in Brazil and the film is called Moment of Contact in the town of Varginha. In 1996, the people of Varginha, Brazil witnessed a UFO event that would change their lives forever. Call it another Roswell, if you will. That is a crashed vehicle that had beings on board. Finally, the facts will be revealed. The Virginia case is considered the most well-kept secret in the military circles of Brazil. Nada temos a esconder. 
My objective here is to put some clarity on what took place in Virginia, Brazil, January 1996. The witnesses are some of the most compelling testimony I've ever heard. Meu nome é Carlos de Souza. Meu nome é Cátia Xavier. Meu nome é Liliane Silva. Meu nome é Valkyria Silva. Em It's interesting when I left to South Africa, I went ahead to South America and in Brazil I had the opportunity to catch up with investigators in the small industrial uh, city of Argina in the state of Minerjais. Actually they were first seen, this aliens, and then supposedly there were two aliens that mm -hmm. were seen by three girls. Two were sisters and one was a friend. Cátia Xavier. Meu nome é Liliane Silva. Meu nome é Valkyria Silva. Em 1996, eu vi uma criatura estranha ali. And they saw that these beings were brown-skinned, they had red eyes, and basically they kind of smelled as well. Eu vi o rastro da criatura pé. Foi onde ele falou que que eu vi era uma coisa sobrenatural. The three fingers is interesting because there seems to be some uh, notion that there's some mummies found in Peru that also have three fingers instead of our normal but five. One, one of the Brazilian army soldiers touched them. It was he came down with some very serious illness. Right. His name was Marco Castanon, and he was actually a military policeman. And he touched the being, and within a few weeks, he had this bad infection in his body, and he literally died. He was only 23 years of age. Mark Pelicherez, he had captured this creature with his bare hands. Você confirma que o seu irmão estava de serviço naquele dia 20? Confirmo. After he captured the creature, he developed this infection that wouldn't go away. Foi pro CTI de manhã, 7 horas da manhã, 15 para o meio-dia, ele veio a óbito. Now the other one, he was actually caught by firemen with a net. He's not touched at all, but they didn't seem to be able to survive in our environment. I had the opportunity with my colleague, uh, Dr. Ricardo Garrick, who was at the time working at the University of Celsius of Campinas to actually uh, meet with some of the doctors who did the pathological study of the alien right. subject. In my conversations with the late Stanton Friedman, this would be considered a sub category of intelligence, in other words, beings that seem to be a hybrid of human animal form mm. characteristic. and characteristic. And then brought back to the U.S. supposedly. A special plane, a buffalo plane, came down to retrieve the specimen. So even though these beings were alive when mm. they were seen, by the time reportedly that the Americans came down, they had died. They mm. were not able to survive. This can't be denied. Bateram na porta. E aí esse lá para mim. Ficar quieto. Se qualquer um ia sofrer uma punição muito severa. This was proof. We pull this off. It'll be the most compelling testimony revealed. Of contact. Aqui, ó. Foi aqui. This is a level of confirmation that only a handful of people on this planet have. I also want to say there's the Phoenix Lights of March 1997 where thousands of people in the city of Phoenix saw a triangular craft go right over the city. Even the governor of Arizona, Fife Simonton, saw it and unfortunately tried to cover it up, but much later he said no. I'm Fife Symington. In 1997, during my second term as governor of Arizona, I saw something that defied logic and challenged my reality. I witnessed a, a massive delta-shaped craft that silently navigated over the Squaw Peak uh, area in uh, North Phoenix uh, in the evening, and it was truly breathtaking. And it was just traveling quietly, made no sound, through the Arizona night sky. I still don't know what it was. As a pilot and a former Air Force officer, uh, I can definitively say that this craft did not resemble any man-made object that I'd ever seen. And it was certainly not high altitude flares as uh, put out by the, uh, the Air Force at Luke Air Force Base because I've never seen flares fly in formation. The incident was witnessed by hundreds if not thousands of people uh, in Maricopa County and in southern Arizona. When it comes to events of this nature dealing with the great unknown, we deserve, I believe, more openness and a serious pursuit of the facts by our government. When and my colleague Jim De La Tosa did some of the analysis, image enhancement analysis of the actual uh, craft that was seen of massive proportion and gave, gave information that clearly showed 
this is a very advanced technology. Mm -hmm. Question, speculation at the time was, was this some type of military technology that was being tested on the civilians, or was this something from a real dimensional origin that was pursuing or surveying events on Mother Earth? Well, let's go on to mm. 2004, because right. that was really the main date. And I want to start with Campeche, because okay. that took place earlier in the year. There was an airplane of the Mexican military that does normal surveillance all over the area of the Gulf of of Campeche and the area of the Yucatan, and they, through their forward-looking infrared radar, were able to spot 11 objects flying. Now, this was all through their radar. Now, many people felt, oh, this was just oil well platforms in the Gulf around there, but that was a little ways away, and these guys have been flying for a long time. They know when they're looking at flying objects versus stationary objects. And they were each uh, between 25 and 30 stories high, according to military Each pilots. object was that big? Each object that say. you see here, not oh, small white objects huge. like tennis balls or Tic Tac, but these were actual large multi-platform, but the Mexican government was prohibited because of the culture shock. In the next segment, we go back to 2004 when the USS Nimitz chased these UFOs. I'm going to see a little clip of that. I'm going to find out what the government and the media did about that. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. Oh my gosh. Look at that thing, dude. Welcome back to the program. We're really happy to be there because this is where we go deeper into the government cover-up. And just as a preliminary, I want to say in June of 2021, the government produced this preliminary report on unidentified aerial phenomena. If you've been watching, you know UFOs are now called UAP, plural. UAP means phenomena. And they issued a report where they looked at 144 cases and said, well, we know what one of those things are. And they labeled the other 143 in the category called other. So this great report that everyone anticipated told us nothing except that there were other things that were still unidentified. So why is that, JJ? Because the consensus of opinion at the top I'm speaking now of the military chain of command as well as experts behind the scene essentially accept the fact that the American public was not really prepared to handle the psychological and the sociological spin-offs. That we as a advanced humanity still needed to have a cosmology of consciousness and that was not forthcoming at that particular time. One of the main things though with 2004 in our country, what sparked all of this, including that report, was a sighting off the coast of Southern California, off the coast of San Diego, an area uh, that is now known as the Nimitz Experience, or the Tic Tac video. Dude, that is a fucking drone, bro. There's a whole fleet of them, look on the ASA. Oh my gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. So look at that thing. It's rotating. What's really interesting about this is it seemed to have some unusual features being seen by these Navy boats mm -hmm. that were off the coast of California. And it happened several times. And finally, on one occasion, there were already F-18 Hornet jets up in the air. So and what they saw in this one place was the churning of the ocean. And when they saw that, they were starting to go and investigate more. And all of a sudden, this small white craft came they, along. And they call that the Tic Tac because it looks like a giant Tic Tac, like the breath lodging. And all of a sudden, after several minutes of really seeing this Tic Tac vehicle, it completely disappeared faster than anything could happen. This event took place in November 2004. The other situation of Campeche, Mexico, in March of 2004, in an earlier book that I wrote in 1973 called The Keys of Enoch, I said that 2004 would be really the watermark, the opportunity for the world community to see the interaction on multiple levels. 
with cosmic intelligence. And mm -hmm. so this prediction came to pass, and this is why I've been working behind the scenes, is there is a paraphysical and a parapsychological ability of the mind to reach out and to see that there is a communication link we have with these higher forces. Right. And the 2004 incident of the Nimitz is what made headlines on December 16th, 2017, on the New York Times, where suddenly the media, politicians, and the average person says, what? There really is something out there. And now we entered a new age of what's called disclosure, a national liberation movement for the truth, because we have to demand the truth. Linda Moulton Howe has something to say about why it's so important that the truth comes out at this time. Because from my point of view, if you are a civilization that evolves for 12,000 years and you are always under the thumb of another intelligence that manipulates you and that humans are never ever mm. talked to, communicated honestly, then we are today in the 21st century, 12,000 years later. We are an abused species without a single general human population okay. knowing okay. and but being told we're not alone. Once we do know, what does that mean? What is that? How does that shift our reality? That we are finally, finally being given respect enough for the truth of something so huge. <laughs> we're not only not alone in the universe, and that I would stress there are other intelligences and they really care mm -hmm. about us and they want us to get past this difficult time of lies, deception by other forces that have never told humans the truth. We have got to start where the news on TV and radio and newspapers begin to understand and start reporting what I have been reporting for 42 years, feeling like I have been pushing a huge thousand pound boulder up a hill. Mm -hmm. We are at the point where it might finally reach the top. Once that boulder starts going, the whole planet changes in relationship to this universe and the understanding that there's probably an infinite number of universes, infinite number of timelines, infinite number of dimensions. Why are these ship he ships here now? They seem to be appearing in greater and greater degree, but why, Dr. Hertog, are they here? Well, if we go back to the Ariel School where the telepathic message was that we're misusing our technology, I think that's extremely important. Of course, I think, again, I want to state for the record, they've probably been watching this planet for thousands of years, but ever since, we did the nuclear bomb testing. The terrible swift power of nuclear weapons has to be seen to be believed. This is a really big fireball. Eternity White Sands. In New Mexico, in the area near Roswell, which there have been more and more extraterrestrial spacecraft. In fact, if you follow the work of Robert Sala. There were two incidents. Um, Oh, within the span of eight days, we lost 20, 20 ICBMs to UFOs. By lost, I mean they were disabled, uh, couldn't be used. So I can't think of a more important subject for DOD to look into than this. So it seems to be that they have been warning us, and this is very important for even right now, not to use in any way, shape, or form any kind of nuclear weapons. But again, you know, we need to grow up. We need to realize we are part of a greater planetary system and work together. And I think when we do, then they will become more closer to us. They will communicate more with even our governments and other situations, and we will realize that we are not alone in the universe. And this is also validated by the declassification of CIA documents in 1975 it showed from Maine to Montana, our nuclear weapon systems and installations were monitored by low-flying elusive objects. So clearly we are being, shall we say, presented with the information that we perhaps are sliding towards self-destruction or technical destruction of our biosphere. And our friends in space, I will call them friends, 
are watching and reporting and, shall we say, even interfering to some degree with advanced technology so we do not destroy really the human evolutionary experience. Many people say when you blast a nuclear bomb that reverberates through the dimension. And that we, without consciousness, we're tearing into other consciousnesses and dimensions in World War II with the atomic bomb. And of course, everything is connected, as we know, in the understanding of the hollow movement of the universe. So we rip a hole in time space here. Other beings are going to say, hey, what's going on there? And that's one of the reasons they're here. They're here in greater numbers. And this is why I feel the government's coming forward, because the, somebody, some ET group said to the government, either you tell them or we'll tell them. And so there's a sort of race for information. There is a high probability that this is beyond the scientific method as we know it. And we have to really define what I call future science or science guided by consciousness to understand phenomena that is between the dimensions or works perphysically in areas that we cannot grasp but is there. And I do have to say, I think our government has known about this, especially since Roswell 1947. There's been reports of Majestic 12 and other government leaders that have known of extraterrestrials, but they're not willing to come forward. And in a certain sense, until we're all willing to grow up, they don't want contact with us. I, what is mm -hmm. it that Stan Freeman said? Mm -hmm. Yeah, who wants to make friends with a bunch of apes whose favorite pastime is tribal warfare? But there are people coming forward. There's someone named Lou Alizanda, who was a former intelligence officer who had the assignment in, I think it was 2012, to look at some of these UFO videos. He didn't know anything about it. And when he saw enough of them, he said, oh my God, this is real. Why aren't people looking at that? eventually ended up leaving the Pentagon and forming with other people a private organization called To The Stars Academy, which wanted to bring this message out, what they're calling disclosure. What we are seeing are objects that can operate in all these domains or all these environments, seemingly without any type of performance compromise, because we've seen these things, they've been recorded, not only in our atmosphere, but there is data to suggest that they have also been tracked by some of our, our capabilities underwater as well and being able to perform in ways that frankly exceed anything that we know we are on, on the planet right now if i have to put my boots back on in order to to make sure this conversation is, is had and ultimately allow the american people to 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 have this conversation amongst themselves then i will do what's necessary short of violating my non-disclosure agreement and, and violating my trust with the american people there's another person i just met recently christopher mellon former defense or Bush and Clinton, he was able to get some of the videos that I showed out to the public and start to break this open. So we have people on the inside, we have experiences on the outside. We need the tribal chiefs, like the ones I talked to in mm -hmm. Brazil. And I believe by listening to what we would call the shamans, the cultural leaders of the indigenous peoples of the world, we will see a middle ground of compassion, love that's overlooked really by the paradigms of Western technology. Right, I'd like to bring up one other person who is an oh. associate of all of ours, and that is astronaut Edgar Mitchell. So when he went up to the moon and back, no, he did not report seeing something, although Buzz Aldrin seems to have reported some things, and then that's been somewhat overlooked. Mm -hmm. But strange enough, Mitchell had grown up nowhere else but Roswell, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. So when he came back as a superstar astronaut, people started coming to him and they started saying to him, oh my gosh, you know, we've seen alien bodies that were here that were part of the Roswell crash. There mm -hmm. could have been as many as two UFOs and several bodies. And so he started investigating this and he became a great purporter of right. extraterrestrials. Uh, Edgar Mitchell really put some of this um, inside stuff on the map. He had a press conference at the National Press Club, which I filmed, and we'll see a little clip of that. And I urge that those who are doubtful, read the books, read the lore, and start to understand what has really been going on, because there is no doubt we are being visited. And as a person who is a part of the first generation of being a spacefarer of our civilization and having gone to the moon, and realizing that I do and many of us do now 
that have seen the Hubble's pictures from space. The universe that we live in is much more wondrous, exciting, complex, and far-reaching than we were ever able to know up to this point in time. It's time politically, environmentally, and I think economically, when we get the technology and the understanding that these craft have, because obviously they're not filling up their gas tank to get here, it will free us from being enslaved to the oil companies and those that are trying to cover up because of money, this incredible phenomenon which is about awakening human consciousness. And also we need intergalactic diplomacy. This is the title of one of my books. Mm -hmm. We have to really push the envelope forward and recognize if they're there watching us grow up, there's a point of sharing intellectual information, scientific information, as we will need in a practical sense to do commercialization, medical research in outer space, and in fact build cities of the future. So. The download now is really up to us to put, as it were, the documentation that we as a humanity will not put super weapons in outer space. And we'll work with intelligence that is consistent really with the great prophets and the great teachings of hu human civilization, that we are part of a much greater tree of life to use a metaphysical symbol. And one more astronaut who was actually a personal friend of ours also was astronaut Gordon Cooper. And although he also did not see UFOs in space, he did see them before he went into space. That means in 1951, when he was flying in jets, uh, they were monitoring the border of East and West Germany above him, and he knew some of the top technologies that we had at the time was a flotilla, again a flotilla, right. of spacecraft. And he realized that they are watching this planet. They're watching to see us. They want us to grow up. They want us to be humanitarians to each other. JJ is going to read a little segment from Gordon Cooper's book called Leap of Faith about what he had to say about the extraterrestrial phenomena. President Harry Truman said on April 4th, 1950, I can assure you that flying saucers, given that they exist, are not constructed by any power on earth. Gordon goes on to write, America has a right to know. It's going to take a lot of courage on the part of some future administration to say, quote, folks, our government has been lying to you all these years. Now we're going to come clean and tell you the real truth. Right. So that is part of this aspect of the phenomenon. There's the government cover-up. There's the ETs. In this next segment, we're going to talk about the experiencer because experiencers are what's moving the movement forward because really the bulk of the phenomena has to do with our personal experience, how it's affecting our consciousness, and how it's transforming and will transform society. So stay tuned as we come back with part three. Welcome back to this very important program I'm doing with my colleagues, doctors JJ and Desiree Hertog. And I feel the most important aspect of this whole phenomena, it's not the cover-up. It's not even what's out there, because we really don't know what's out there. It's how it's affecting us. So in this segment, we're going to talk about experiences. It has to be okay to talk about your personal experiences, and up until now, it has not been. You want to talk about some of the great cases? Well, Alan, a lot of them are in your book, Making Contact. Yeah. So we just mentioned the fact that it's not all extraterrestrials. We believe that it's also can, involved in multidimensional realities because most people think if you're talking about extraterrestrials, you're talking about like a flying saucer that you can, you know, stamp with your foot if you see it. But what happens when they take you, which many of the experiences have had, through walls in the middle of the night? I mean, who are these beings? Why are they here? And what are they doing to us? And what is the effect when it's traumatic and it's transformative. So some of the great cases in history, of course, is Whitley Strieber, who's given us the picture of the ET on the front of his book, Communion, and our good friend, Travis Walton, who's gone five days aboard a ship. So Travis is an amazing person. So he had this experience where he was, he saw this vehicle, and then he walked out towards it, and he was hit by this beam of light. And he still doesn't know if the beam of light killed him or took him into the spaceship, but he ended up in the spaceship. And once he was there, he only remembers a very short time, and he was gone several mm. days. In five days he was off planet or somewhere. And somewhere. he only remembers the hours of it, literally. 
But with that said, he realized that one, he had the power to overcome some of these alien influences. At the time, uh, it was called an abduction. It was uh, uh, horrific to me and my crew. And um, it was perceived very negatively at the time. And uh, that I think that uh, helped um, motivate a lot of the attacks and the resistance that we got because it was frightening. People are afraid. And so if they don't want to believe something, they'll come up with a justification for disbelief. And um, that was what hung over our heads for so long. But it has changed. There's been a paradigm shift. Uh, I had 45 years to think about it. So gradually <laughs> it came uh, apparent to me that the idea that the way I interpreted it initially uh, wasn't correct. I woke up in a great deal of pain. I felt like I was dying. I mean, it, it was uh, it was the greatest fear and pain all combined with seeing these beings and being in this situation. So it was as, just about as maximally tra uh, traumatic as, as could be. But over time, the fact that uh, I was returned at all and uh, was in excellent health after that, um, all kinds of medical tests, um, started to shift my uh, concept of these beings as, uh, you know, Hollywood has done, you know. If these beings um, had bad intentions, uh, it'd be over already. I mean, these, it's, they've been coming here for decades. This, this is not a new phenomenon. It goes way back. And um, if they really wanted to replace humans on this planet, well, we'd have never known what hit us. It'd be <laughs> poof, you know? He now thinks maybe he got hit by that beam of light and it killed him and they actually restored him. So that's an interesting take well, on there it. There are lots of cases where UFOs have harmed people with high RF radio frequencies, cutting off a sort of radiation that people have suffered from radiation damage. But there's other cases where people had healings from UFOs. So I just want to say also when people say, you know, good or bad or who are they, I think it's just like people on this planet. It's the same consciousness reality throughout the whole, we'll call it local universe, which means, you know, you got a few people you don't want to walk down the street with and you have other people who are there trying to help you. I think there's more people who are altruistic trying to help us in outer space, but we have to do a lot ourselves. I would like to avoid the dualism of good versus bad or evil because we're working with different mindsets and different right. levels of consciousness well, experience levels. Well, basically, levels. it really means that there are many forms of intelligence. You know, people say, well, how come you get cigar shape? How come you get saucer shape? You know, don't they all fly in the same kind of vehicle? Well, no, because they're not the same species. We believe that various species are now visiting our planet. Some of them are the small grays, some of them look more reptilian, some of them look just like us. And some of them aren't even physical or semi-physical. That's what you're calling the ultra-celestials. In my book, Making Contact, the Hurtox have a chapter, chapter three, where they talk about the different levels. There's the physical, there's the ultra-celestial. Extra-celestial. Extra and there's the ultra-terrestrial. Talk about the difference of those. Well, we always have fun, so to speak, in conversations with university students who think only of the extraterrestrials in terms of Hollywood mythology. To the contrary, we have many different levels of intelligence. One, which we call the extracelestials, deal with an energy form of light, or what we will call superluminal light manifestation, coming from a sphere that suddenly opens up into a face or a whole body manifest for a few seconds. Beyond this, we have various meta-terrestrial, what we call in the Keys of Enoch, the ultra-terrestrial, those who are like the great uh, archangelic forms we find in the Judeo-Christian tradition. So we're being given, really, an opportunity to grow up and become cosmic citizens. Depending on the culture, there are different levels of cosmic intelligence. So in a way, you're really talking about consciousness. If we go back to the consciousness question in the next episode, this is where we bring it all home. What level of consciousness are you at? 
where you want to go, how will meeting the extraterrestrial shift your energetic field? And are you ready for a great awakening? That's what's coming up. Welcome back to part four of this exciting show that we're looking at all phases of UFO contact and really the most important, as I mentioned in the last segment, is this understanding of consciousness. What is consciousness and how does this phenomenon affect us? And one of the things I feel it does, it merges this old scientific paradigm of objective and subjective reality. Correct. Talk about that, JJ. Well, Desiree and I have been fortunate to work with Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher in uh, publishing a book called Mind Dynamics in Space and Time. Elizabeth Rauscher, author of no less than 450 scientific papers, worked uh, behind the scenes at Stanford Research Institute with those who had the ability to see distant objects without technology. And so we have a scientific database showing that the human mind does have this ability, if it wishes to use it, to see really other levels of reality. And apparently extraterrestrials and extracelestials are using really the paraphysical dimensions to reach the human mind, to download information, and gradually prepare us to take, as it were, the great leap forward to be citizens of a greater universe. I think it's all about consciousness. And I love your book, Alan, mm -hmm. where it says, you know, even if you just see a UFO out there, maybe even at a vast distance, you seem to then become entangled with that extraterrestrial. Now, the report we wrote in your book is about a young woman who actually had seen extraterrestrial intelligence and communicated with them. And she was talking to them and they said what she should say and what she shouldn't say to the public. Well, she was sitting literally in my friend's kitchen and she, the guy who she was sitting next to was a lawyer and he kept prodding her and prodding her and all of a sudden the shelf literally flew up that had been there for forever and it didn't drop down, it flew up. She goes, I can't say anymore. There seems to be this entangled quantum consciousness linkage that they have. Now that can scare a lot of people, I get that. But this seems to be how they work. Even if you go back to the Ariel School, there was like a mesmerizing scenario. If you go back to reports from Linda Moulton Howe, who we are a very good friend of ours, yes. who talks about uh, even the military encounters. You know, be careful when they're looking at you in the eyes. They give you like almost the hypnosis type of vibration. So now we want to invite Grant Cameron to join us in this little discussion about why consciousness is so important to this phenomena. Apparently, it's the big thing in quantum physics now is to look at consciousness. Twenty years ago, it was it, it was basically illegal to talk about consciousness. You would basically lose your funding, everything. Now it's a big thing. Everybody, especially if you're retired, you're all working on consciousness. Uh, you know, the guy won the Nobel Prize, uh, Josephson. He he was ostracized when he was when he was doing ESP. When he was at uh, you know he'd won the Nobel Prize, and now he's working on it. He, and a lot of these guys in in quantum physics. That's the big thing now is to talk about quantum physics and explain, because everybody knows there's a Nobel Prize in this, to try to explain the, the nature of consciousness. And they haven't gotten anywhere because they've got it backwards. They think matter creates consciousness. Then it's this idea that you and I have understood for years and that we're trying to teach other people and that the beings are whatever the intelligence is trying to explain to us indirectly is this idea. It's all consciousness, it's all here and now. There is no future, there's no past past and future, it's all here, it's all now, it's all in this weird concepts. All your lives are stacked on top of a book and you can actually interact with people in the, your people in the future and the people from the past. You, you can live a life in the past and you hear, start hearing this really weird stuff that basically anything's possible because it's all done with the mind. Whatever you want to imagine yourself doing, you can do. We all share a consciousness. If you've ever walked into a room where there's an argument, you feel that vibration. So if we're on a lower level, it's really going to affect our neighbors. So what we're moving into is a fifth dimensional and higher reality. There's a really lower level, which is the animal body. There's nothing wrong with the body, but we're at a lower level, like we said before, of tribal warfare. And war has to end if we really expect to meet these beings on the level where they can give us technology because they gave us free energy, some would just go about and making bombs on that. So we have to graduate, JJ, and I know well that's said, Well work. said, well said. Making contact yeah. is merely making contact with yourself first. Then you are able to make a decision. Are you qualified for precognitive or normal or supernormal conversation with 
something else in the universe. Right, and so there's been research in our brain anatomy, so to speak, and how the neurons work. And according to Elizabeth Rauscher, we can actually operate in eight-dimensional space just with the power of our mind. That's what some of this remote viewing is about. How can someone sitting here go and see something in another part of the world and they're instantaneously there. That's this entangled quantum field that they're part of. But what's important to that is not just to accept that reality because it's been proven over and over again by many researchers at s special scientific labs, but the fact that we have that higher ability that's the same as extraterrestrial. This is the time yeah. of graduation, a time of opening the portal to ascension. The ability that we can move from the third dimension to the fifth dimension, the fourth being a mathematical construct. I just want to also say, talking about the brain, there is, seems to be in contactees and remote viewers, a larger portion of a particular part of their brain seems to be developed that is a signature piece for people who have had these experiences. So, so go back to the question, Ellen, what is consciousness? Is mm -hmm. it simply the flow of sodium ions in the brain? Or is it the ability of awareness to work on multiple levels? In other words, to work in all space rather than under the arbitrary space and time constructs. In other words, we at Stanford Research mm -hmm. Institute and other think tanks, and the work with my late colleague, Dr. Andre Puharch at Lab 9 in New York, showed carefully the ability of precognitive experience as well as the ability to entertain well, multiple levels of contact simultaneously. That gets back to my main point. I don't think consciousness is contained in the brain. I think consciousness is an epiphenomenon. I think it's like a radio receiver. The signal is not coming from the radio. It's being received by the radio. And our brains are receiving units of this great cosmic being that is non-local. I agree with you. Consciousness is the hidden variable in quantum transitions beyond statistical s systems of measurement and data verification. We're working with, as it were, a whole new concept of the mind and consciousness being a construct, what the ancients called the nashama, the soul spirit of being able to reach out into the drama and into the worlds of others that have gone beyond physical evolution. And I like the way Lynn McTaggart has placed mm. this in the field, that's mm. one of her books, or The Power of Eight, that really consciousness is everywhere. In fact, all information, all contact can be made through that field without the separation of the physical reality. We actually have that same consciousness ability that they have. In fact, I think we can be at least consciously connected with them in our as peers and have that a greater ability. But it also gets us into understanding what the field at Limit Taggart or consciousness is non-local. It is not contained in the receiver. Even the memories you have are not in your receiver. They may have different points of it. So when you develop a higher sophistication, because this this organism, this brain is the most sophisticated receiving unit in the in the cosmos so we as we develop more neocortex neurological connections we pick up a greater amount of the signal from the cosmos ingo swab the first and foremost at least in the, this country remote viewer uh, officially he and harold sherman actually remote viewed jupiter prior to any of our probes going there. And they saw mm. a couple things. One, they saw this atmosphere that would be glistening, and they saw that there would be a very thin ring. Now, we didn't see that in any kind of telescope, but when our probes went there, yes, we saw that there was a ring around Jupiter. So how did they do that? How did they go from, we'll say, the USA, and see what no one knew about out there in Jupiter? You see here in my book, actual document released to the NASA probe to Mars and actually see four mm. pyramids here in mathematical arrangements. Mm. Mother Nature doesn't work like this. But we were know. able to show that the power of the mind could reach out before the probe to Mars and actually see things that were not supposed to be there. This is where telepathic communication between us and ETs, higher dimensional beings, it's our ability to feel telepathy or get information from these beings, and many, many people are doing that, and they're rewriting history because they're getting a new downloader for information about our true place in the cosmos. So don't discount 
te telepathic communications from ETs because it's the next level of our civilization. So we need more than rewriting history. We need to make the futurism incorporate a great leap forward or advancement in all our areas of science because this is the breakthrough that's coming very soon. I believe through some government group in the world's arena of contact information, we're going to establish the fact not only that there was once a previous civilization of some sort on our sister planet Mars, but we are in the arena of being updated by the cosmic others. And from Dr. Jack's experience, he was told that 64 areas of science were going to take a quantum leap. And I believe the understanding of how our brain works in connection with the quantum field is part of that. So this mm -hmm. is how aliens work. They don't always, when you see them and people have had these encounters, mm -hmm. it, a lot of it is telepathic. How do we apply this intent of mind, remote viewing, telepathy is one, but also maybe we can control the ships, which is what these ETs are doing. They're controlling it with their mind. Well, this is called telethought communication. Yes. Telethought communication is allowing us to see and experience other realities, so we take human responsibility to help humanity on all sides of Mother Earth to grow up mm -hmm. and to share synergistically the symphony of song, the symphony of higher language, we would call the language of thought forms or the language of light, mm -hmm. to make this leap possible where the humanity advances collectively as a human civilization. And I just want to say, you know, we've been talking about extraterrestrials mainly, but it's important that we realize that we have that ability as well. So exactly. when you see something happening in one part of the world and you want to change that, send thought forms of peace and love or whatever is required, healing energy, to that part of the world well, and you can make a difference. Right, that's why the next point I want to get to is that essentially we are the same as those beings. We're not local to the human form. We are the extraterrestrials here. We do not seem to be evolved from the lower primates. They don't have the skills we have that are the gods, the divine. So to use the language of future science organization, this means that we acknowledge we are biotransducers or conduits for information from a cosmic language coming through our vibratory system as we work with this and as we re-energize ourselves, it goes on from a third dimension into the fifth. We become vibratory senders and receivers of information. We become co-creators of a greater design of realizing that evolution doesn't stop with Mother Earth. It goes on into the greater cosmos. I just want to throw in one point because many people argue about, you know, how does this relate to the Bible? Well, if you go back to the book of Genesis, what you find is we were originally in light garments and we fell into this concretized reality. So basically what you're saying is accurate. We actually have a higher, we'll say, mathematical matrix reality and we simply became from a fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth dimensional reality into a third slash fourth, and well, we forgot well, it I want work. to talk about this idea of fifth dimensional realities because everyone's throwing out interdimensionality. Yes, we're in the 3D, but our consciousness is not of the physical world. We can shift dimensional realities. We can move into this fifth dimension. And what does it mean to move into a different dimension? It means that the world changes, our notion of the world, our perceptions change. And our separations right. are but dissolved. Our ability for greater thought is enhanced and we become a new species living in a different dimension which will uplift the frequency of the planet. We're at the graduation point of history where we're going beyond the old science, the old traditional religious paradigms into a deeper and more profound spirituality of realizing mm -hmm. we are all part of a divine process mm -hmm. of growing up in a vast and wonderful universe. Right, and that's why the ETs are here now. They're here because we are ready of, at this point of graduation. We are at the threshold of a new time. So they're here because if they didn't come, we'd probably just be doing the same old thing. But because we have a little outside influence, a little more energy, a little more awareness, and who knows, they may have given us the great technologies like fire even, that have been not available for the lower primates. But because we have new technology, we're able to access the world. We have web telescopes going to distant planets, looking for life there. 
but life's already here. So it is our moment of graduation where we can meet the cosmic others on a level playing field and give up the old wartime primitive ways of being. And also beyond technology, we're going into super consciousness. Mm -hmm. We have the gift of remote viewing, remote sensing, remote healing, etc. These are gifts the ancients considered the gifts, the domator, they used the Greek word, of the divine or Holy Spirit. We are beginning to gradually understand that there are other dimensional aspects of the human psyche that can be open well, and shared. Well, I'll talk about for a moment Sedona, where we were there and there was a fire. Many people were getting afraid. We said, look, why don't we just put our energies into creating rain and let the fire go away? And we did that collectively. Many people in the town did that. And they were able to influence the change. And the fire literally was put out. So these are all the possibilities. But I want to say one of the important things, going back to extraterrestrial realities, is the work of astronaut Edgar Mitchell. And when he was coming back from the moon, back to Earth, he had what he calls the overview effect. He saw how we were really all one. And I think when we get into that fifth dimensional reality, we lose the separations. We see ourselves as a greater humanity. And we realize that we're all sparks, we would say even sparks of the divine. So we're graduating yeah. from homo sapiens to homo universalis. I have a great clip from one of our evolutionary leaders, Bruce Clifton, where he's talking about the next level of, of our evolution as a oneness of being. We are not humans until we create humanity. Uh -huh. When we create humanity, which is when we all recognize that we're all cells in the same living organism mm -hmm. and work in a coherent fashion, we have then created the next level of evolution. Once we come together in community, the synergy of awareness that will be passed from one cell to the next would be the equivalent of taking a single amoeba and comparing that life of that single cell to my human body, which is a community of amoebas. So yeah. now the community of humans are... Are a multicellular organization, okay. which comes together and makes a wholeness. Okay, now, but here's the interesting part. It sort of like jumps like bootstrapping itself. One cell mm -hmm. later becomes a, a human which later becomes humanity. Mm -hmm. And when humanity is complete, the Earth as an organism mm -hmm. completes its evolution. It's a living, breathing, pulsing Gaia. Uh -huh. It is now complete. When it is complete, what did when the cell completed its evolution, what was its next level of recourse? To hook up with other cells. Right, and when the human completed its evolution, what was it? To, to hook, hook up, up with, with other, other humans. humans. Right. When the Earth completes its evolution, uh -huh. We are then at the level of a unity mm. with a voice of unity that allows us to speak as a one, which will allow us to speak uh, with other ones. Beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. Each of you joining us today are part, really, of the future citizens of Mother Cosmos, graduating from the schoolhouse of Mother Earth to the University of the Cosmos. We welcome you to think about a new cosmology of consciousness, of how each of us will play a role of going beyond negativity and three-dimensional, shall we say, Earth's ego-centered reality to that of the divine, the human family. So look for these key points that we just outlined. First, there's a lot of cases, a lot more UFOs in the world being reported, and more people are having experiences. The, the government is suddenly breaking its brick wall of denial and those that wall is tumbling and now they're coming forward with more possibilities fourth in part is that all of our consciousnesses is, is expanding it's expanding because it's our time to wake up and really come into the humanity that we deserve as truly what jj and desiree call about universalis as we're going into a bright wonderful future as citizens of the House of Many Mansions. You're part of this. We are all part of this. Thank you so much for your time here today. Thank you, Kurt Johnson, for making this possible. And all the people watching, we welcome comments. You can reach me at newrealities at earthlink.net. You'll reach the Kurt Talks at futurescience.org. And get my book, Making Contact, preparing for the new realities of extraterrestrial existence because 
It is one of the key points that give us an overview of some of what we talked about today. Thank you very much for joining us, Alan Steinfeld, along with Drs. JJ and Desiree Hurtock. Ad Astra to the stars. In closing, I wish to stress how important it is that we stay in the we space. It's extremely important that all those that have researched this topic or have had direct experiences share openly, consciously, and factually with the mainstream media so that the general public could have a full picture of this issue and have time to personally integrate this expansion of awareness of other intelligences into their daily lives. It's a profound privilege to be on planet Earth during this moment of choice, where we can consciously participate in ushering in a fully intergalactic age with our cosmic family. Let's seize this moment for the benefit of all. Thank you very much.